Chauncey Gardner, Mr. Rand's close friend and advisor, was at the meeting this morning. I found Mr. Gardner to have a feeling for this country that we need more of. Hal Ashby's Being There, an American fable about an illiterate gardener who is accidentally catapulted into the world of American power politics, is often cited as being people's favorite critique of American political life. The 1979 film is based on Kaczynski's 1970 novel of the same name, though the novel goes way further, since readers may enter Chance's mind and actually see what he's thinking about at given points. There is something truly likable about Chance. His absence of internal weight makes him a man truly at peace, as his benefactor Ben Rand says. And of course, Peter Sellers' brilliance in the role goes a long way to making Chance feel his flesh and blood real, as such a fanciful character ever could. Sellers' straight face turns a performance seemingly devoid of humor, since Chance is incapable of ever really getting the joke, after all, into a comic tour de force. Excuse me. I'm very hungry. Could you give me some lunch? It's an all-girls show, sir. It's an all even without getting into the biblical dimensions of being there, since the novel unfolds over seven days, the female lead is named Eve, and there's a lot of time spent in gardens and with an all-powerful older man, the story is surprisingly engrossing. This got me to thinking, since virtually everyone who encounters Chance in the film and novel instinctively trusts him, I wondered why this is so. Why does everyone like Chance so much? What's so unique about him? When I took the time to break it down, there were many different reasons that people like Chance, so I thought I'd enumerate them in a video that might be instructive to viewers who were fans of Sellers, Kaczynski, Ashby, or perhaps just the very idea of being there. First, though, it must be understood that it is in the nature of an allegory that the main character is someone we must root for. It is the reader's destiny while reading or watching Being There to hope that Chance continues along, inadvertently making fools of the elites in American society, whether it be publishers... I can't read. <laughs> of course you can't. No one has the time. Or ambassadors... Excuse me, but would you tell me your name again? I'm a muric on humor. Or even the president. On television, Mr. President, you look much smaller. We keep hoping that it will somehow continue on. The chances emptiness and incapacity to grasp much of what's happening will remain undiscovered by the other characters. Okay, so why is Chance thought of with such fondness? The first thing that jumps out at the reader or viewer of being there is the power of the Vanna White effect. As everyone knows, Ms. White, the model on the Wheel of Fortune, doesn't say too much. As a result, it was found that people tended to imbue her with whatever political views they wished. There is an assumption that she is with the viewer, no matter what the viewer thinks. Since Chance becomes famous overnight, after being a guest of the Rands, and then subsequently being introduced to and then quoted by the president, though he has still not said anything in public, Chance becomes a kind of Vanna White. He is not liable to offend anyone. Chance is the perfect vessel. He can be anything people want him to be, from reactionary to democratic socialist to plurocrat to libertarian. Perhaps some people would assume he was a supporter of the Green Party. He is, in fact, in the end, a blank page, Kaczynski's original working title for being there. To a gentleman in the film who prefers men over women, Chance, despite never really being informed what sex is, is someone who appears to be bi-curious at a minimum. We could go upstairs right now. Is there a TV upstairs? <laughs> <laughs> I like to watch. You like to, uh, watch? Yes. After sitting down to chat with the Soviet ambassador, the man becomes convinced that Chance speaks Russian. I believe that you know, Krylov. Get blue for colleges, for kids, for dinner pizza. So, you know your Krylov in Russian, do you? Mr. Rand, played by Melvin Douglas, believes that Chance was once a businessman of some sort in a former iteration, and thus someone who is simpatico with his own approach to business. You mean your business was shut down? Yes. Shut down and closed by the attorneys. That's exactly what I mean. The businessman today is at the mercy of kid lawyers from the SEC. Eve Rand, played by Shirley MacLaine, perceives Chance as a source of emotional strength, a man who is modest and charming, mature and controlled. I heard he speaks eight languages, and on top of everything else holds a degree in medicine as well as law. Beyond this obvious Vanna White effect, the other characters invariably see Chance as an original, a kind of palate cleanser. 
By reading more into him than is really there, and since he's virtually devoid of cogent thought in any event, in a very real sense, the other characters are actually enjoying themselves, by themselves. That is to say, whenever someone is with chance, in essence, they are alone. He is refreshing because, unlike other people, he's not trying to dominate conversations, not pontificating about his own ideas, not convinced he's right no matter what, and most important of all, he never corrects anyone about anything. For example, Chance's reticence to dominate social interactions convinces Eve that he's secure within himself, that he wants to listen to her thoughts more than share his own. She sees this as unique and valuable. From her perspective, Chance is someone who clearly values her for herself rather than as just a sex partner. She trusts rightly that Chance likes her and would never hurt her. She spends a wonderful night with Chance, it is true, which she describes as a revelation. In truth, of course, she has gotten herself off. Chance watched. That was his entire contribution to her ecstasy. Since Chance is incapable of satisfying her sexually, emotionally, or otherwise, she satisfies herself. She perceives her evening with Chance as being something utterly original and involved, as a demonstration of Chance's masculinity and maturity and control. Of course, in truth, what happened was just plain old vanilla masturbation, mixed up with a little voyeurism. Apparently it did the job, though. Desire flows within me. And when you watch me, my passion, it dissolves the desire. People are drawn to Chance and trust him implicitly because he seems to bring order to the chaos of their lives. In the novel and movie, his presence seems to promise a semblance of control over things. For example, in the lives of the Rands, in just a day or two, Chance moves from total stranger, a pedestrian involved in an accident, to trusted confidant, to best friend. He is even able to put Ben's mind at ease over who will care for Eve once he is gone. You're fond of him too, aren't you, Eve? That's good. Ben is so taken by Chance, his strength and sincerity as a person, his down-to-earth nature, that he cannot hate Chance or see him as a rival for Eve's affections. Instead, Ben is eager for Chance to take over his role as protector and companion for Eve. While discussing Chance with Dr. Allenby, Ben gives Chance credit for helping him face the end with more inherent dignity. He credits Chance with helping him find the courage to die. Since he's been around, the thought of dying has been much easier for me. And of course, in his last few moments before his death, Ben requests to see Chance one last time, stunningly, not his wife, Eve. Give me your hand. Let me feel your strength. I hope that you'll stay here with Eve. Take care of her. Of course, in terms of the larger society, Chance's presumed optimism about the economy is the actual reason for his popularity, as he becomes, in modern parlance, something like a media influencer. His statements about the inevitability of decay and rebirth in a garden are mistaken for an insider's assurance that boom and bust are natural, and that the economy, like a person who's sick once in a while, will eventually recover on its own. Spring and summer. Yes. <clears throat> then fall and winter. Yes. The president, played by Jack Warden, is somewhat leery until Ben intervenes and lends his endorsement to Chance's words. After this, everyone seems to understand what they think Chance is saying, including the household staff. In the Kaczynski novel, Mr. Rand's secretary sums things up nicely after she sees Chance's appearance on TV and gives him her evaluation. The exact quote is, I have never seen anyone more at ease or truer to himself. Thank goodness we still have people like you in this country. Throughout the film, Chance seems open to others, to meeting them and listening and accepting them at face value. This tends to make people feel better about themselves, perhaps even good about themselves, and about the future. He sometimes makes people laugh, either by saying something oddly simplistic, for example about the elevator. That's a very small room. <laughs> yes, sir, I guess that's true. Smallest room in the house. Yes, sir. I guess that's true. Or even just an anticipation of what he might say next. <laughs> Sorry, sir. Rather than punching down at people, as a truly powerful man might, Chance treats everyone as though they are important, as though they matter. 
We notice this when Chance meets the producer of the Gary Burns program on which he is to appear. Do you realize more people will be watching you tonight than all those that have seen theater plays in the last 40 years? Oh, yes? Yes. Why? Hell, I don't know. <laughs> As I have mentioned, Ben is actually pleased to learn that Eve has taken a liking to Chance. Rand looks forward to the commotion that Chance and Eve will cause at the reception that Senator Rowley's widow is holding for the Soviet ambassador. You and Eve should create quite a stir. <laughs> In the limo, Eve informs Chance that she has feelings for him and that Ben accepts the situation. I feel so close to you, Chancey. I feel safe. Ben understands my feelings for you, by the way, and he accepts them. Chance simply encounters people and does not really have any expectations of them or what they might think of him. I think you should ask Mr. Rand that. He is not invested in, nor is he even aware of, trying to live up to the identity that the media has created for him, a profoundly deep thinker about American business and economic prospects. To most people, this would be inconceivable, but it makes Chance seem super well-adjusted. One quick question, Mr. Gardner. Uh... It has often been said that success breeds success. Because Chance was introduced to the president as Benjamin Rand's dear friend, and to America through the words of the president, as Benjamin Rand's close friend and advisor, Chance is like a boulder rolling down a hill and just picking up momentum as he goes. People see profundity within his pronouncements because they expect that his pronouncements are in fact profound, instead of facile. People just assume that Ben Rand wouldn't be friendly with someone who wasn't a person of consequence. For Eve, it is meaningful that Chance has gained her husband's approval. If Ben likes Chance, this is the ultimate form of validation to Eve. Similarly, it means a lot to Eve when Ben tells her that the president was really taken with Chance. Having a house guest that both she and Ben genuinely like in Ben's final days is a comfort to Eve, who tells Chance as much. John C., I'm, I'm just so very grateful that you're here with us. So am I, Eve. Throughout being there, Chance is refreshingly direct. Ben shows that he gets this in a way when he informs the president... Now, I must warn you that Chauncey is not a man to bandy words. <laughs> this is insightful, and like many pronouncements about Chance, has the added virtue of being true. We'll come back to that in a moment. Since Chance has nothing to say in the first place, he could indeed be described as being economical with words. Nevertheless, Chance is also, by luck or instinct, surprisingly spot on with his comments to others. For example, with Eve, he asks a very frank and nearly profound question on his first night in her home. Before that, though, he solemnly warns her of what she knows only too well, but he says it in a way that implies he cares. Ben is very ill, Eve. I've seen that before. She takes this not as something obvious or even invasive to say to her. Instead, she sees this statement as enormously empathetic, as though Chance knows a little of what she's experiencing each day, watching her husband wither and die. Chance truly cuts through a lot of bullshit here and onto the chase. Eve sees him as someone who does not waste time, but who, mercifully, gets to the point. Chance follows up by asking Eve what is obvious to everyone working in her mansion, and even the viewer. Eve. Are you going to leave and close this house when Ben dies? He inquires because of his own experience of what happens when old men die. You are driven out of their house, regardless of how long you've tended their gardens. Eve is kind of taken aback by Chance's candor, at least initially, and can only stammer... I, 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 I don't think so. Then Chance punctuates this interaction with a clipped... Good night, Eve. All this occurs at the end of his first night at the Rands. Mentioning Ben's ill health and his impending death is indeed not bandying words. These things are foremost in Eve's mind, that sooner or later Ben will not be around to protect her, and that she will be alone in the world. As a vibrant woman, it may be many years before her own death, so she must decide for herself how to live out the rest of her life. Chance's seeming candor is disarmingly earnest and causes Eve, in turn, to be entirely honest about her situation, of being married to a much older man. After this important moment, Chance and Eve are more like friends or confidants than strangers. Though incapable of comprehending an abstract, largely subjective concept like humor, Chance is nevertheless interpreted as being a man who likes to make an occasional joke. 
Are you planning on making any sort of claim against the Rands? There is no need for a claim. I don't even know what they look like. <laughs> this moment leads Dr. Allenby, played by Richard Dysart, to say the following to Eve. You know, he's very, um, intense. Actually, I found him to have quite a sense of humor. Hmm. When someone thinks a person is witty, whether they're doing so intentionally or not, this becomes their identity. So it is with Chance. Others come to think of him as the witty guy. And of course, Chance keeps a straight face throughout the entire film, which takes the levity to a new level. You may find, my friend, that we are not so far from each other, huh? We are not so far from each other. Our chairs are almost touching. <laughs> bravo, bravo. It is worth mentioning here that humor works on two levels in being there. On the one hand, there are the things that others, like Dr. Allenby and the servant in the elevator, perceive as being humorous. But on the other, there are the scenes that are funny to the viewer only. Tell me, Mr. Gardner, have you ever had sex with a man? No, I don't think so. Or this scene. Would you like a car, sir? Yes, I would like a car. Yes, sir. Thank you. On the first level, the other characters are reacting to what they perceive as Chance's playfulness, as though he were actually attempting to be witty. On the second level, we viewers are laughing at the general misinterpretation of Chance that they, the other characters, cannot seem to fathom as occurring. This second level of humor is more important than the first. It acts as a kind of fail-safe, helping the viewer truly invest emotionally in Chance's adventure. The brilliance of the script is that humor in the context of the film simultaneously ramps up our sympathy for Chance. We laugh at the misunderstanding, of course, but we feel something like sympathy for Chance at the same time. He is out of his depth, to be sure, but the fact that he's unaware of it means that everyone else remains unaware of it. We truly need Chance to remain undiscovered. The primary difference from Kaczynski's novel to the Ashby film is the addition of the Dr. Allen B. character. He becomes a player in the plot and eventually comes to understand that Chance is in fact a gardener and is not Chauncey Gardner, a persona invented and enhanced by everyone he encounters after Eve first mishears his name. Dr. Allenby, however, sees no reason to burst the identity bubble within which Chance subsists, since the lives of Ben and Eve are greatly invested in and enhanced by the presence of Chauncey, the man they think Chance is. The viewer is left to ponder whether or not there are other reasons that Dr. Allenby refrains from disclosing what he knows about Chance. Is it, for example, because it would not seem sporting to prematurely end Chance's adventure? It is also possible that once Dr. Allenby has the same information in his possession as the viewers, he may also be curious to see what happens next. In addition, he seems to feel protective of Chance, who is really the ultimate innocent. In other words, like the viewer, Dr. Allenby also feels invested in Chance's welfare. Ben would like me to meet the president. We would, would he? Yes. How will I know when it's 10 o'clock, Robert? Well, this stands to reason. After all, doctors take an oath to do no harm, and so Dr. Allenby does not act. However, he does call Chance Chance and not Chauncey, to prove to us that he has figured out the truth and is now in on the joke. You've become quite a close friend of Eve's, haven't you, Chance? Yes. In the end, Chance appears to the other characters as 100% sincere, and they grow to appreciate him for it. Paradoxically, their perceptions are often stunningly close to reality. That is, they get some sense of who Chance is, albeit enhanced by their own misperceptions, yet some of what they perceive still flirts with reality. For example, when the Soviet ambassador meets Chance and characterizes him as Krilovian, it is accurate. Chance is indeed like a character in a fable, albeit not in a story by Ivan Krilov. When the financial editor of the Washington Post, Sidney Courtney, describes Chance as laconic, it's accurate. Incidentally, the gentleman in the back of this scene is named Hal Ashby. In any event, Ben's descriptions of Chance are every bit as perceptive as the ambassador's or the editor's. Oh, Chauncey, you have the gift of being natural. Uh, you know, Chauncey, you don't play games with words to protect yourself. 
No, you're, you're direct. That's one of the things I admire about you, your admirable balance. You seem to be a truly peaceful man. This is especially accurate. Chance is entirely without pretense, and Ben recognizes this immediately upon meeting him. Ben perceives or misperceives Chance's lack of depth as peacefulness, and it is easy to see why. Devoid of indecision and insecurity and neurotic self-absorption, all the hang-ups of modern man, Chance seems evolved in comparison. Similarly, Chance is strong, as Ben says just prior to his own death. And Ben's perception of Chance as being someone productive and hardworking is also correct. Unlike other people whom Ben might encounter in Washington, all the lobbyists and politicians and lawyers and diplomats, Chance is indeed productive and was previously engaged in organic, useful, rewarding hard work in the garden. He was truly working with his hands to produce something of value. Whatever Chance says about himself is equally accurate. On the Gary Burns show, when he declares... I am a very serious gardener. It is essentially correct, though others take it to mean that he might have ambitions for high office. When he tells the publisher, I can't read, and then discloses to Eve that, I don't read papers, Eve, or tells Ben that he does not recall what they had been discussing the day before, he is being 100% accurate. When Chance mentions that he has never ridden in an automobile before, he truly hasn't. It is equally clear that he has never previously made or received a phone call. Where is he, there or here? He's on both lines. Unfaced by consequences, Chance tells the press the unvarnished truth. Mr. Gardner, the New York Times spoke of your peculiar brand of optimism. What was your reaction to that? I do not know what it means. Uh, sorry to persist, sir, but it would be of great interest to me to know just what newspapers you do read. I do not read papers. I watch TV. The reporters take Chance at his word, and one even praises him. Eve is impressed. Chancey, I've never seen anyone handle the press the way you do. You are so cool and detached. Thank you, Eve. Eve. Again, it is no act. Chance is indeed cool and detached when confronted by the press, since he does not care what they think or say of him, nor will he ever be able to read, much less grasp, what is in those editorials. And it goes without saying that Chance is being 100% honest when he initially answers Eve's query in the car. Are you related to Basil and Perdita Gardner? <laughs> no, I'm not related to Basil and Perdita. Oh, well, they are such a wonderful couple. My husband and I are very good friends of theirs, and we often visit their island. It does not seem likely that Chance is related to Basil and Perdita Gardner. Just as he does with Eve, inquiring about whether or not she will close up the house when Ben dies, so Chance is also disarming with Ben. When Chance is informed that part of the house has been glassed in so that extra oxygen can be pumped in to raise Ben's spirits, Chance responds. You must be very ill. This comment creates intimacy with Ben. Aplastic alivia, Mr. Gardner. Aplastic alivia. Ben begins to open up about the extent of his illness. As the evening progresses, Ben begins to bond with Chance and mistakenly comes to believe that Chance's business was bankrupted after being plagued by legal and tax issues. This is something close to Ben's heart and he begins to see Chance and himself as simpatico, both firm believers in the free market who see regulation as inherently anti-business. Chance likes Ben and worries about him. After meeting with the president, Chance says something really significant to Ben. I'm sorry you're so sick, Ben. He knows only too well what happened to the old man and what is now awaiting Ben. The look in Melvin Douglas's eyes tells the whole story here. The genuine look of appreciation is quite something and helps tell the story of what Ben is going through, or indeed any sick person. In this scene, Ben seems to realize that Chance truly cares, that it's not just another throwaway line, which he probably hears way too frequently. As a chronically ill person myself, I can tell you how much this means when someone unexpectedly recognizes the degree of your suffering. Ben Rand, despite his wealth, is no different. By being kind to him, Chance ingratiates himself in ways that are not possible for a healthy person to grasp. It is hard not to like someone who is kind to you when you are most vulnerable. This happens again when the Washington Post editor calls and Eve interprets Chance's failure to immediately take the call as an example of Chance's sensitivity to her feelings at that moment, 
when Ben is clearly becoming sicker and sicker. Go, go, Chauncey, I'll be just fine. Yes, you'll be fine, Eve. In the end, Chance is liked for all these reasons, his real self, as well as what is perceived by others as being his real self, and three other reasons to boot. First, he is invariably polite and agreeable with everyone he meets, whether a servant or the president. He makes each person in turn feel like they matter. When someone is nice to him, like Eve, he repeats exactly what she said back to her. It's very hard for me to leave you. It's very hard for me too, Eve. It's tough to go wrong when all you do is agree with the other person. Second, he is well dressed. It is well known that people are supposed to dress for the job they desire. Chance's suits leave the impression that he is a man of means, someone near the center of power. With his tailored suits and conservative grooming, people make an assumption that he probably has an elite education. This serves him quite well as he makes his way through American society. Finally, and most importantly, he's great on TV. As Ben puts it, after seeing Chance's appearance on The Gary Burns Show, it is indeed remarkable. One way or the other, Chance is a natural. Yes. A garden needs a lot of care and a lot of love. I hope you enjoyed watching my take on being there and why people have such affinity for Chance. Feel free to like, comment, and subscribe. Uh, tell me, Mr. Gardner, would it be possible for you to stay here for a day or two so we could keep an eye on? Oh, yes, I could stay here. Does this house have a garden? Oh, yes, many.